Hi everyone, welcome to the second part of the NCRT Simplified series. Today we are going to discuss the first chapter of biology which is life processes. So we are going to start with this chapter. This is a pretty long chapter which deals with many topics. First one is photosynthesis. Second is the process of digestion in humans. Third topic is the respiration in humans as well as in plants. Fourth is the circulation in humans. Fifth is the transportation in plants. Sixth is the process of excretion in animals. And also seventh is the excretion in plants. So these are the topics that we are going to cover in this particular chapter. So starting with the first part that is definition of living organisms. How do we define a living organism? How do we characterize a living organism? So there are large number of factors which decide whether an organism is living or not. One such factor is growth. So if we take growth alone as a characteristic of living organism, then we can see that there are some organisms which do not grow, which do not show external growth. And of course, some non-living things like the sand boulders and mountains, even they also grow, but that growth is from outside. So growth alone cannot be considered as a characteristic of life. Another important characteristic is reproduction, but again there is exception. Mules, sterile worker bees and infertile human couples, these organisms do not reproduce. So reproduction again cannot be considered as a defining feature of living organisms. Another important factor is the metabolism, which is the chemical reactions which is happening inside our body. So that can be considered as one of the fundamental characteristic of living organisms because only living organisms exhibit metabolism. Fourth important characteristic is the cellular organization, which is again unique to living organisms. So multiple number of factors have to be considered for defining a living organism and for distinguishing between a living and a non-living organism. Now, when we talk about movements, movements is not about change in lock, uh, change in its position, but it can be movement of substances from one cell to another or from a part of a cell to another part of a cell. But why are these movements, which is not even visible to our naked eye, important for life? We know that our body is made up of large number of cells and we know that cells form tissue, tissues form organs, organ form organ system and so on. So these cells, which are the fundamental basic building block of every living organism, that are made up of a large number of molecules. So if there is uh, any climatic change or if there is any environmental resistance, then what happens is any sort of environmental turbulence can cause a breakdown or we can say a disruption in the structure and the functioning of a cell. So to keep this cell in its place and to uh, for the proper sustenance of the living organism the breakdown and the repair of these cells are important and since the cell is made up of molecules alone the movement of molecules across the cell and from one part of the cell to another is very important so that is why these molecular movements are very important for the sustenance of every living organism so that can be one of the three mark question which can be asked from this introductory paragraph why are molecular movements needed for life so here is the answer living organisms are well organized structures they can have tissues tissues can have cells cells have smaller components in them and so on because of the effects of environment this organized ordered nature of living structures is very likely to keep breaking down over time if the order breaks down then the organism will no longer be alive so living creatures must keep repairing and maintaining these structures and since these structures are made up of molecules so they must move molecules around all the time now there is an exceptional case that is of viruses viruses can be considered as living organisms as well as they can be considered as non-living organisms as well so let me take three different cases let us imagine a virus is outside the host organism virus is a nucleoprotein now what is the meaning of nucleoprotein nucleoprotein means it consists of a nucleic acid as well as it consists of a protein coat that's the meaning of a nucleoprotein so once this virus is outside the host organism it is known as virion this virion is considered as a non-living organism whereas 
when this nuclear protein that is virus comes inside the host body two different cases are possible first case is its infectious stage when it is infecting the human cell or any other organism cell so in the infectious stage it is known as a virus and this is the living stage of a virus but after infection it will inject the its own genetic material into the cell and it is moving out from the host organism without any genetic material so the organism which is not having any genetic material is known as ghost so this ghost is also the non-living form of a virus so virus can have three different states two states are non-living and one is living so this is why the case of virus is indeed a controversial case even none of the scientists are able to explain whether viruses are living or not because they are obligate parasites and cannot live without a host organism so i hope this introduction part is clear to you now let us now start with the first part of this chapter that is nutrition so what exactly is nutrition we need energy for carrying out the basic metabolic activities to get this energy we eat food this food is required for our metabolic activities and also for the synthesis of a large number of biomolecules the intake and utilization of the various nutrients or food is known as nutrition there are two types of nutrition the first type of nutrition is known as autotrophic nutrition so i'll take a blank slide to explain this auto auto means self and trophic means prepare so if the organism can prepare its own food then it is known as autotrophic nutrition hetero means not self it's the opposite of auto so if we are not preparing food on our own then it is known as heterotrophic nutrition so plants and certain blue green algae and certain bacteria comes under the category of autotrophic nutrition whereas majority of the organisms like the protista the fungi some of the plants as well as all the animals comes under the category of heterotrophic nutrition now i mentioned one word some of the plants there are some heterotrophic plants as well but they are not completely heterotrophic but in some part of their life cycle they will be heterotrophic like the venus flytrap or the picture plant these plants require nitrogen and they do not have any mechanism for absorbing nitrogen directly from the soil so to uh, utilize or to maintain its nitrogen requirements it eats insects it consumes insects and whatever nitrogen content is present in the insect that is taken up by the plants in other way in other for other purposes that is for its own needs the plant can produce its own food that is it is following autotrophic mode of nutrition but just for the nitrogen metabolism it is consuming other organisms and all the animals are considered as heterotrophic there are different modes of heterotrophic nutrition like the saprobic nutrition the symbiotic nutrition and the holozoic nutrition humans are following holozoic nutrition because we are ingesting the food we are intaking the food with the help of our mouth that is why it is known as holozoic nutrition so let's start discussing about autotrophic nutrition in plants so autotrophic nutrition in plants is carried out by a simple process which is known as photosynthesis photosynthesis is a process which is carried out by majority of the green plants and also some of the bacteria carbon and energy requirements of the autotrophic organisms are fulfilled by photosynthesis and what is happening in photosynthesis the plant or the bacteria that is taking some external components like the carbon dioxide water sunlight and it is going to convert it into carbohydrates which is complex sugars in the presence of sunlight as well as chlorophyll now this word is very important chlorophyll is necessary for carrying out photosynthesis there are different forms of chlorophyll like the chlorophyll a b c d and so on but chlorophyll alone is not necessary for photosynthesis along with chlorophyll a there is a necessity for other accessory pigments like the xanthophyll the fucosanthin phycoerythrin and so on so chlorophyll is the chief pigment which is required for photosynthesis but along with chlorophyll some other pigments are also required for the process of photosynthesis which is acting as the accessory 
pigments. So as a result of photosynthesis, the plant is able to produce carbohydrate that is in the form of glucose or fructose in any other form and this is providing energy to the plant. So today we are going to study the first topic that is how the plant is going to produce this glucose from carbon dioxide and water. The plants are able to produce carbohydrates from carbon dioxide and water through two steps. The first step is known as light reaction and the second step is known as dark reaction. So first one is known as light reaction and the second one is known as dark reaction. So if you would recollect the structure of a chloroplast, I'll just draw a rough structure here. So the structure consists of an outer membrane and it also consists of an inner membrane. And inner to this, the region here is known as the stroma. Inside the stroma, there are large number of thylakoids, which are stacked together, one above the other, forming grana. The space inside the grana, that is the space, the space inside the thylakoid, that is known as the lumen. So this is known as the lumen and this is known as the stroma. The light reaction happens in the grana and the thylakoid. So here is the site of light reaction. In light reaction, there are a large number of events that is happening. First step is the absorption of sunlight. The sunlight which is falling on the leaf surface is absorbed by the grana. In the grana, there are specialized proteins called photosystems which are responsible for trapping the sunlight of necessary wavelength. And after this, it is going to release a large number of electrons. But this sunlight alone cannot produce enough amount of electrons. So for that purpose, the water that is taken up by the roots of the plant is also used for the release of electrons. Because we know that water, if I take water, this water can give H2 plus half O2 plus two electrons. This two electrons will also enter into the chain. And next step is the transport of these electrons through a large number of electron carriers. And once it gets transferred through these electron carriers, finally it will pass through an enzyme which is known as ATP synthase enzyme. This results in the formation of ATP which is adenosine triphosphate. Also in this cyclic pathway of flow of electrons, there is formation of another molecule which is known as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate which is NADPH. These two molecules that is ATP and NADPH which are known as the energy currency of the plant are produced in this step that is in the light reaction. So in light reaction we have seen that three major events are happening. First one is the trapping of the sunlight, photolysis of water that is the splitting of water to give electron. Next step is the electron flowing that is the electron transport system resulting in the formation of ATP and NADPH. The ATP and NADPH which are formed in the thylakoid membrane that is now released into the stroma. So now the ATP and NADPH that are present in the stroma of the chloroplast. So inside the stroma the next set of reaction happens that is known as the dark reaction. Please note that dark reaction doesn't mean that it is happening in the absence of light. It just means that light is not necessary for carrying out this particular reaction. So it is also known as the biosynthetic pathway because it is in this step that the glucose is formed and it is also known as the light independent phase because light is not required. But since the other one was known as light reaction that is why this step is known as the dark reaction. So here what happens is that using this ATP and NADPH there is a process which is known as Calvin cycle operating in the stroma resulting in the formation of glucose. It's an 18 step process and that results in the formation of glucose. This glucose is stored in the plants as its source of energy. So now let's see what is mentioned in NCRT regarding photosynthesis. So here is the equation for photosynthesis 6CO2 plus 12 H2O reacting with chlorophyll and sunlight. In the presence of chlorophyll and sunlight it is getting converted into glucose 
oxygen and water so the byproduct that is formed is oxygen along with glucose and that oxygen is released into the atmosphere so here the steps are given first step is the absorption of light energy by the chlorophyll that is by the photosystems second is the conversion of light energy into chemical energy and the splitting of water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen so this conversion of light energy into chemical energy results in the formation of atp and nadph reduction of carbon dioxide into carbohydrates this is happening in the dark reaction the first two events are happening in the light reaction and the third one is the dark reaction so these are the steps that is happening in photosynthesis in the textbook it is also mentioned about the factors which is affecting photosynthesis factors affecting photosynthesis includes chlorophyll sunlight carbon dioxide etc even water is an important uh, element in photosynthesis and the steps that is happening that takes place in a different way these steps need not take place one after the other immediately for example desert plants they take up carbon dioxide at night and prepare an intermediate which is acted upon by the energy absorbed by the chlorophyll during day because if it is doing uh, the same pathway as that of the ord ordinary plants then what happens is there is lot of water loss that is happening because the temperature is extremely high in the deserts so to remove that to avoid the excessive water loss from stomata the cactus and the other desert plants they have adopted a specialized pathway which is known as the crassulation acid metabolism pathway or the cam pathway now what is this crassulation acid metabolism pathway it is a specialized pathway in which the stomata remain closed during day and open during night so the carbon dioxide fixation happens at the night that is the important point in order regarding the uh, desert plants that is why they are said to have a scotopic stomata that means night active stomata so this is the picture of a stomata now stomata is important for the pulling of water the water that is absorbed by the root that comes to the root uh, root if someone is pulling it right so this stomata is going to pull the water from the plant body and it is going to release out back into the atmosphere and also the exchange of gases between the surroundings and the plant body happens via the stomata so that is why stomata is very important when water molecule is entering into the guard cell the cells that is surrounding the stomatal pore that is known as the guard cell so when water is reaching this guard cell it will causes the guard cells to become turgid and that causes the opening of the stomata and once the water loses it will again shrink and that results in the closing of the stomata so that is the mechanism of opening and closing of the stomata and one hormone is also there that is the abscisic acid which is important for controlling this opening and closing of stomata so this is the picture of open and closed stomata as you can see this is a p shaped stomata so that is kidney shaped stomata so it is a dicot plant in the case of monocot it should be dumbbell shaped stomata so we have seen about how the plants are producing carbohydrates it's through a set of two process first set of process is known as light reaction and the second step is known as dark reaction in light reaction three steps are happening the first one is the absorption of sunlight second step is photolysis of water that is the splitting of water to release electrons now the electrons are flowing that results in the formation of atp and nadph then came the dark reaction in the dark reaction the atp and nadph that is formed in the thylakoid membrane is pumped into the stroma and inside the stroma there operates a cycle which is known as the calvin cycle and that results in the formation of glucose molecule so this was the process of photosynthesis but now how is the plants absorbing the inorganic nutrients like the nitrogen phosphorus iron magnesium etc nitrogen as you know is a very important essential element which is used in the synthesis of proteins as well as other compounds like the amino acids so that can be taken up by the plants either in the form of nitrates from the soil nitrates means no3 minus or it can be in the form of nitrites so either in the form of nitrates or it can be in the form of nitrites nitrate means it is no2 minus and nitrite means no3 minus so in either of the form the plant can take up nitrogen and this is usually helped by bacteria 
certain bacteria are present certain symbiotic bacteria which are present in the root help in the conversion of atmospheric nitrogen to soluble nitrogen that is how the plant is getting nitrogen similarly there are some bacteria which helps in the absorption of phosphorus and iron as well so there are different groups of bacteria which is helping in the absorption of these inorganic minerals which are very important for the plant body so let us move forward with the second type of nutrition which is known as heterotrophic nutrition heterotrophic nutrition as we have seen that it is seen in majority of the animals including humans and also in organisms like protista so first let us see the steps involved in the digestion of amoeba so here you can see the picture of an amoeba first of all when a food particle is nearing the amoeba what happens is it is going to extend its false feet that is known as pseudopodia so it is going to arrange its pseudopodia in such a way that the particle can enter inside like this so once it is entering inside it will engulf the particle as you can see over here and it results in the formation of a vacuole that vacuole is known as a food vacuole now this food vacuole is going to digest on its own the process is known as auto digestion so as a result of auto digestion the food particle that got engulfed inside the amoeba's body is now completely absorbed so that is how the digestion is happening in amoeba step number one the food particle is nearing now the pseudopodia is going to extend and it is going to form a food vacuole and ultimately results in its digestion so these are the steps involved in the digestion of amoeba it's a very simple process but what about the process in humans that's what we're going to study next so now let's start with the process of digestion in humans so digestion in humans is carried out by the alimentary canal so I'll write the spelling here alimentary canal and certain glands so alimentary canal and certain glands are responsible for carrying out the process of digestion in humans so let us study the structure of the alimentary canal it looks something like this this is a picture from NCRT which is showing the human alimentary canal and this picture is important the labeling can be asked for the examination the alimentary canal is a very long tube with nearly 7 meters of length and it starts from the mouth or the buccal cavity and then it is going to pass through the esophagus. It will open into the stomach. Through the stomach it is going to enter into the small intestine then to the large intestine and finally it is going to leave out to the anus. The process of intake of food is known as ingestion I-N-G-E-S-T-I-O-N and the process of excretion is known as ejection. So there are five steps involved in the process of heterotrophic nutrition. Step number one is ingestion which is the taking of food. Step number two is digestion. Step number three is absorption that is absorbing the nutrients into the cells. Step number four is the utilization of the nutrients which is known as assimilation. And step number five is the removal of waste products which is known as ejection. So these are the five steps which are involved in the process of digestion in human body or nutrition in human body so let's start with the structure or and the function of each and every part of the alimentary canal starting with the first one that is the mouth mouth is also known as the buccal cavity and the buccal cavity consists of two components number one is tongue and number two is teeth so first let us study the structure of a tongue so as you can see i'll zoom this picture so here you can see that our surface of the tongue can see we can see large number of finger like projections so we can see that on the surface of the tongue there are a large number of finger like projections these finger like projections are called as papillae they are known as papillae some of these papillae have taste but not all the papillae have taste but but some of them have taste but which are located at certain regions like the taste buds sorry the papillae which are present on the back side of the tongue they are responsible for the bitter taste whereas on the front side is responsible for the salty next the tip the tip of the tongue is responsible for the sweet taste and both the sides is responsible for the sour taste so bitter salt sweet and sour are the four different tastes which we can perceive now here you can see that there is no taste buds for chilies but still we are able to perceive chilies because our tongue also have certain pain receptors so when we are eating this chili 
what happens is that these pain receptors getting activated and as a result of which we get the sensation of chilies now the second important point is related to the structure of teeth in our mouth in an adult human there are 32 teeth and these 32 teeth are different in their structure and function so if you look at the oral cavity we can see that there are four types of teeth which are embedded in the socket of the jawbone so here you can see that the teeth are embedded in the socket of the jawbone and this type of arrangement of a teeth in which the teeth is embedded in the socket of the jawbone is known as teco don't dentition and you can see that there are four different types of teeth so that is why our dentition that is the arrangement of teeth is also called heterodont dentition that means different types of teeth are present so hetero means different so heterodont dentition is present in humans what are the four different types of teeth that is present number one is incisors number two is canines number three is premolars and number four is molars there are four different sets of teeth so now let us study what is the number of incisors canines premolars and molars so to study that easily we have the concept of dental formula so let us see what is that human dental formula so for studying human dental formula I'll make a picture here imagine this is our buccal cavity so this is our buccal cavity this is the upper half and this is the lower half now I'm going to divide this further into two halves like this so now I have divided this into two parts so here some incisors will be present canines will be present premolars will be present molars will be present the number of incisors canines premolars and molars we are going to write in the numerator of the equation and the number of incisors canines premolars and molars on the bottom side we are going to write it in the denominator so here I will write the number of incisors canines premolars and molars on the upper jaw and in the denominator I will write so here I will write the upper jaw and in the denominator we have incisors canines premolars and molars of the lower jaw so this one is 2 1 2 3 and this one is also 2 1 2 3 so this is the human dental formula what does it mean in this particular region there are two incisors one canine two premolars and three molars similarly in this side we have two incisors one canine two premolars and three molars similarly here also we have two incisors one canine two premolars and three molars similarly here we have two incisors one canine two premolars and three molars so total number of incisors is coming out to be this two into four that is eight canines is coming out to be this one into four that is four premolars is coming out to be eight and molars is coming out to be three three into four that is twelve so these are the total number of teeth which are present in the human adult 8 plus 4 12 plus 8 20 plus 12 32 number of teeth are present in an adult human and in babies it is 20 so this is how we calculate the number of teeth using the human dental formula dental formula is the arrangement of teeth on the upper half and the lower half of the uh, jawbone now what is the structure of a teeth if I take an individual tooth a single teeth is known as a tooth so if we look at the structure of a tooth we can see that it consists of three regions the top region the visible region of the tooth is known as the crown the next region that is here this is known as the neck and the bottom region is known as the root now the visible hard surface the chewing surface of the teeth is made up of enamel and the remaining part of the teeth is made up of dentine now this tooth is held in place with the socket of the jawbone by means of another chemical which is known as cementum so cementum is the chemical cementum also known as cement is the chemical by which the tooth is embedded into the socket of the jawbone enamel is the hard chewing surface of the teeth and dentine is what is making the structure of the teeth now let us see what is mentioned here in NCRT regarding the following section we eat various types of food which have to pass through the same digestive tract naturally the food have to be processed to generate particles that are small and of the same texture so that is the main purpose of 
chewing of food. This teeth and tongue along with saliva helps in chewing of the food. Now what is the importance of chewing? Chewing will make sure that the particles of food that we are eating are converted into sub particles of equal sizes so that it is easy for us to digest. That is the main reason. So along with this teeth and tongue another major substance that is helping in the process of digestion is the saliva. So now let us study the components of saliva first. So as we can see that majority of saliva is made up of water. So I'll make a pie chart here. Nearly 99% of saliva is made up of water. So this 99% is made up of water. And in the remaining 1%, nearly 0.7% is electrolytes. Electrolyte means ions. Ions includes sodium, potassium, chlorine, etc. And there is certain enzymes. 0.3% is made up of enzymes. What are the two important enzymes? One enzyme is known as tylene. Tylene is also known as salivary amylase. This enzyme that is salivary amylase which is also known as tylene is very important because it is helping in the conversion of starch molecules into maltose. So it helps in the conversion of starch into maltose. Not the complete starch but still nearly 30% of the starch is converted into maltose by this particular enzyme that is salivary amylase. And there is one more enzyme which is known as lysozyme. Now do not get confused with lysozyme and lysosome. So these three terms should be very clear. Some means it is used to represent, it is actually SOME, it is used to represent a part or a cell or a component of a cell. Zyme is used to, used as a suffix for enzymes, certain enzymes and zymogen is the suffix which is used for inactive enzymes if I take an example lysosome is a part of a cell it's a component that is an organelle of the cell whereas lysozyme is an enzyme another example is that of pepsinogen tryptozymogen these are inactive enzyme they either ends in zymogen or they ends in gen now, another example for this SOME and SYME is ribosome. Ribosome is an organelle and ribosyme is a nucleic acid which have catalytic property. So, these terms should be clear to you. So, the two enzymes we have seen, number one was tylene which is salivary amylase which is used for the conversion of starch into maltose that is breaking down of starch into maltose and Lysozyme is an antibacterial agent. If any bacteria or virus or fungal enters into our digestive tract, this particular lysozyme is helping in treating. Uh, means it is going to destruct or kill those particular bacteria or viruses. This lysozyme are also present in the tear glands. So that is why if some infection is happening to our eyes, large number of tears is coming. Now these are the functions of saliva. It helps in lubrication and protection, buffering action that is the pH control of our mouth, maintaining the tooth integrity, antibacterial, antifungal and antiviral purposes and taste and digestion. So after mixing with the teeth and tongue and saliva, now the food is going to get converted into bolus. So bolus is the form of the food after all the purposes is happening inside the oral cavity. Now this bolus is going to pass through the next part of our alimentary canal which is the esophagus. So in the esophagus this is how it is going to move. So here you can see that the esophagus is a very long tube that is extending from the mouth towards the 
stomach here is the stomach and here is the mouth so from the mouth to the stomach it is going to extend and the food is going to pass from the mouth to the stomach in a regulated manner in such a way that there is rhythmic contractions and relaxations that is happening so as a result of this rhythmic contractions and relaxations it is going to move through the esophagus so first what is happening a section of the esophagus when this bolus is passing through the esophagus a section is going to contract and the food bolus is going to pass through now that section is going to relax and the next section is going to contract similarly this rhythmic contraction and relaxation of the esophagus the muscles or the sphincter muscles of the esophagus that results in pushing the bolus down into the stomach and this type of rhythmic contractions and relaxations of the esophagus is known as peristalsis p e r i s t a l s i s this is known as peristalsis which is the contraction and relaxation in a rhythmic manner by the muscles of the esophagus which results in the pushing of the food bolus into the stomach so now the food have reached into the next part of our alimentary canal which is the stomach so inside the stomach there are large number of glands which are known as gastric glands so here you can see on the walls of stomach there are a large number of gastric glands and these gastric glands secrete different kinds of things so i'll show you some of these secretions first one is the mucus cell which is present on the gastric gland that helps in the secretion of mucus another one is the parietal cell which helps in the secretion of hcl hydrochloric acid and also one intrinsic factor that is a factor which is responsible for the absorption of vitamin b12 if that factor is absent then we will be suffering from a disease which is known as pernicious anemia due to the deficiency of vitamin b12 next one is known as chief cell chief cell secretes pepsinogen so here you can see a gen that means it is an inactive enzyme pepsinogen is an inactive enzyme which is converted into its active form that is pepsin so pepsinogen is an inactive form that gets converted into pepsin when hydrochloric acid acts on it so that is when pepsinogen is getting converted into pepsin now this is the purpose of hydrochloric acid this pepsin is responsible for the splitting of the large protein molecules into smaller molecules that is proteases peptones etc so that is the function of this pepsin molecule so the digestion functions are taken care by the gastric glands which are present on the walls of the uh, stomach and they also release hydrochloric acid a protein digesting enzyme which is called as pepsin and also mucus hydrochloric acid creates an acidic medium which facilitates the action of the enzyme pepsin and another thing is that this mucus lining mucus which is produced in the stomach that is responsible for counteracting the acidic condition of the acid because hcl is highly acidic so that highly acidic medium should not degrade the walls of the stomach so to protect the walls of the stomach from the excoriation or the destruction by the acid this mucus is going to help in that particular purpose so this was all about the stomach section we have seen what is there in the stomach on the lining we have gastric pits and inside these gastric pits we are having large number of glands these are known as gastric glands and we have seen what are the different types of glands which are present one is the mucosa neck cell second is the parietal cell and third is the chief cell mucosa neck cell secretes mucus parietal cell secretes hcl and chief cell secretes pepsinogen pepsinogen is converted into pepsin by the action of hydrochloric acid which is present in the stomach and now this pepsin is used in the breakdown of proteins into peptones proteases etc moving on with the next part that is the intestine the exit of food into the stomach and from the stomach into the next part that is the duodenum is controlled by means of certain muscles and these muscles are known as sphincter muscles these sphincter muscles are extremely important because they prevent the backflow of the food whereas in the vomit reflex just the opposite is going to happen the backflow of the food is going to happen that is the contents are ingested through the ingested through the mouth that is it is excreted out through the mouth that is known as vomiting so except in the case of vomiting in all other cases the sphincter muscles are going to close once the food is passing from one region to another 
So we have one such sphincter which is present in the esophagus to stomach opening that is known as the gastroesophageal sphincter. Similarly, one more sphincter is present which is guarding the entry of food from the stomach to the small intestine which is known as the pyloric sphincter. Pyloric sphincter because the last part of the stomach is known as pyloric region that is why it is known as pyloric sphincter. So now the food is going to enter into the small intestine. Small intestine is known as the longest part of the alimentary canal. Do not get confused. Small intestine is very long whereas large intestine is very short but its diameter is greater that is why it is known as large intestine. Small intestine is called so because its diameter is very less. So this small intestine is very large and it is highly coiled and the length of small intestine is different in different animals depending on the food that they eat. So this is the picture of small intestine. This is the small intestine. This complete structure is known as the small intestine and here this is the small intestine of a carnivore. This is that of a herbivore and this is of a carnivore. You can see that the length of small intestine is more in the case of herbivore. Reason is because carnivores eat meat and meat is easy to digest whereas herbivores eat cellulose and cellulose is difficult to digest. Since cellulose is difficult to digest the length of the small intestine is more. That is the reason for that. So this is the structure of small intestine. Small intestine consists of three regions. First region that is the opening from the stomach that is known as the duodenum. Next region is the coiled region that is known as the jejunum. And then we have a highly coiled region which is known as the ileum. So three regions are there. Duodenum, jejunum and ileum. And the ileum is going to open into the large intestine. Again guarded by a valve which is known as ileocecal valve. Because the first part of the large intestine is the cecum. So this part is known as the cecum and cecum is a storehouse of microorganisms. Maximum number of microorganisms which are present in our alimentary canal is located here in the cecum. And there is a vestigial organ which is a wasteful organ which is present on the cecum that is known as the vermiform appendix. Now the next region of the large intestine is known as the colon. So colon is a little long section. And that is divided into four sections. One is known as ascending. This is known as the ascending, transverse, sigmoid, sorry, descending and then a sigmoid colon. So four different parts are there. Ascending. So I'll rub this and I'll draw again. This is known as ascending, transverse, descending and sigmoid. Sigmoid means it is something like S. It's an S-shaped colon. That is why it's known as sigmoid colon. That is leading to rectum and rectum is leading to anus. This is how the anatomy is going. Large intestine does not have any role in the, pro in the process of digestion. That is an important point to note. Large intestine have no role in the process of digestion. Majority of the digestion and absorption process happens in the small intestine. In fact, the complete digestion of carbohydrates, proteins and fats is happening in the small intestine. And this is happening because the secretions of the intestine, which is known as the intestinal juice or the succus endericus, along with the pancreatic juice and the bile is coming to the same region. So all these juices that is the intestinal juice, the pancreatic juice and the bile juice which is coming from the liver are responsible for the complete breakdown of carbohydrates, proteins and fats. The reactions and the steps which are involved in this process is not at your level so we are stopping with this. The food that is coming from the stomach is acidic. So that acidic food have to be made alkaline so that is carried out by pancreas because pancreatic juice is alkaline so to act upon this acidic food the bile juice is going to act on the food so the bile juice act on the acidic juice acidic component of the food and it is going to get converted into the basic form now this basic form is acted upon by the pancreatic juice so once again, the food that is coming out from the stomach is acidic, that is acted upon by the bile and that results in the conversion of this acidic food into a basic food, basic components of the food and now the pH is highly increased. Now the pancreatic juice can act upon and it can divide it into its simplest components like the proteins are converted into amino acids, the carbohydrates are converted into sugars, 
and the fat molecule that is acted upon by the bile juice and it results in the emulsification of fats now what is emulsification of fats a large fat molecule suppose this is a large fat molecule that is converted into smaller fat molecules this is known as emulsification of fats now these smaller fat molecules are acted upon by the various enzymes of the pancreas that is known as the pancreatic lipase and it is going to get converted into fatty acids and glycerol which are the fundamental units of fat a fat molecule is made up of fatty acid and glycerol so those simplest molecules are formed by the action of this particular pancreatic lipase so the action of emulsification is similar to that which is done by soaps and detergents the same purpose is happening here also so now the food which is digested in the intestine is now taken up by the walls of the intestine the inner surface of the walls is having large number of numerous finger like projections i'll show the picture for that yes this is the picture as you can see the walls of the small intestine consist of large number of finger like projections which are known as villi and each individual villi have further finger like projections which are known as microvilli which is giving it a brush border appearance it is a brush border appearance so this brush border appearance of microvilli is extremely significant because this helps in increasing the surface area and this increased surface area helps in carrying out the process of absorption easy absorption means the food molecule or the basic units that is formed like the amino acids the sugars etc they are now directly going to enter into the bloodstream however fats cannot enter in the same way so it is entering through another mechanism by the formation of chylomicrons so that we will be discussing in class 11 so maximum of the absorption happens in the small intestine however some amount of absorption can happen in the mouth like the homeopathic drugs some can happen in the stomach like the alcohol and majority of water is happening water and certain drugs are getting digested in the large intestine as well so every part of the alimentary canal have some function or the other in the process of digestion so after absorption of the food that is the food has now reached individual cells of the body now each of these cell is going to carry out the assimilation process assimilation process is the process in which energy is released by utilizing this basic units of food that is known as assimilation so as a result of assimilation new tissues can also be made up and also the old tissues can be repaired because now the cell have energy using this energy it can produce new cells and whatever repair issues was there that is done with this particular energy that is known as assimilation and whatever unabsorbed and wasteful food is there that is now going to pass through the anus the process is known as ejection that is again regulated by anal sphincter so it is going to remove through the anus and that completes the process of digestion specifically the nutrition in humans now one more topic that is present in this topic that is dental caries dental caries which is also known as 2 decay is gradual softening of the enamel the enamel is the hardest substance on earth and that is going to get softened because of certain issues with our teeth and also there is further softening of the dentine and this is mainly due to bacterial action on the sugars that produces certain acids and soften and demineralizes the enamel because this enamel if you are placing it in hydrochloric acid or any other acid it slowly starts getting degraded so the same action is happening here also the bacterial cells which are present in, present in our mouth is releasing certain acids and these acids are responsible for softening of the enamel and that causes tooth decay the only way to remove tooth decay is to remove the plague before the bacteria can produce acids and that is by brushing the teeth every time after we eat something so this is the all about the process of digestion in humans and also we have discussed about nutrition in humans protista and in plants that is photosynthesis so this completes the first part of this chapter that is nutrition now let us move forward to the second part which is respiration so now we have discussed about what was nutrition and what is the significance of nutrition we are getting food and the food is getting broken down into simpler molecules so that the cells can absorb it but now 
how is the cells utilizing the energy the process of utilization of this energy is known as respiration respiration happens at each and every individual cells of our body let us see how is the process of respiration happening respiration begins with glucose molecule we know that glucose is a six carbon containing molecule so if we make a structure of glucose molecule i'll show you a structure it is a six carbon containing molecule with hydrogen and oil group place like this this is the structure of glucose molecule so it's a six carbon containing molecule one two three four five and six so it's a six carbon containing molecule and now what is going to happen is this is going to be acted upon by either oxygen or without oxygen this is going to split into two molecules of three carbon each that is the first step of respiration so respiration begins when a six carbon containing glucose is split into two molecules of three carbon containing pyruvic acid which is also known as pyruvate now this pyruvate can either proceed with the presence of oxygen or without the presence of oxygen if it is going to enter into the pathway which utilizes oxygen it is known as aerobic pathway and the process of aerobic pathway happens in the mitochondria of the cell please do note that this process of splitting of glucose into pyruvate happens in the cytoplasm and the process is known as glycolysis so the first step in respiration is glycolysis which is the splitting of glucose which is a six carbon containing molecule into two molecules of pyruvic acid having three carbons each in the second step what is happening this can either go into the aerobic pathway that happens in the mitochondria of the cell where a single pyruvic acid molecule is getting converted into three molecules of carbon dioxide and water releasing enormous amount of energy nearly 1200 kilojoules of energy per mole of glucose this much energy is released in the aerobic pathway and another way is in certain bacteria and fungi it can enter into another pathway which is without utilizing oxygen that is known as anaerobic pathway an anaerobic pathway can result in the formation of ethanol molecule and release of carbon dioxide water with a very little amount of energy another method of anaerobic pathway happens in the muscle cells of humans in the absence of oxygen that results in the formation of lactic acid lactic acid up to a certain limit is useful because it is responsible for releasing a little amount of energy but if there is accumulation of lactic acid that can cause us muscle cramps and that is what is happening during heavy intense workouts this results in the formation of lactic acids in the muscle and that causes muscle cramps so now let us study in detail about the process of respiration so this is a schematic representation of the process of respiration cellular respiration in detail so this can be asked in the board examination directly so this is very important glucose which is a six carbon containing molecule in the cytoplasm is converting into pyruvate which is a three carbon molecule also known as pyruvic acid and it is going to release certain amount of energy this event is known as glycolysis which is the splitting up of glucose that is known as glycolysis now this pyruvate is going to check for someone who is it checking for it is checking for whether oxygen is present or not if oxygen is present it is going to go into the mitochondria and it is going to release carbon dioxide three molecules then it is also going to release certain amount of water and large amount of energy if oxygen is not present like in the case of yeast it is going to convert into ethanol carbon dioxide and energy in the cytoplasm itself so this is having practical application because it is used in preparation of beverages in the muscle cells if oxygen is not in sufficient quantity then this pyruvic acid can get converted into lactic acid and energy so this is the three different pathways in which the pyruvic acid can act upon so now let us understand how this energy is produced so in this particular process first of all we have glucose and the glucose is converting into pyruvic acid 
Now this pyruvic acid is entering into the mitochondria. Inside the mitochondria, the event which is known as Krebs cycle is happening, which is a 10 step event, which results in the formation of large number of energy carriers like the ATP, GTP, NADPH, NADH, FADH2, etc. There are a large number of such energy carriers which are operating inside the mitochondria. Now these energy carriers, out of all these, ATP is the fundamental energy carrier. Like we are converting many energy carriers into one single unit that is ATP. So this is known as our currency. Now why is it known as a currency? Because whenever we need energy, this ATP will break upon itself resulting in the release of energy. So to understand how ATP releases energy, I will make a rough structure of ATP. which looks something like this. This is the structure of ATP. It consists of a nitrogenous heterocyclic ring which is attached to 3-phosphate moiety. Now whenever the cell requires energy it is going to break this bond between one phosphate moiety and another phosphate moiety and now this is going to move out as a phosphate molecule. The remaining part is an adenosine plus 2 phosphate molecule that is why it is known as adenosine diphosphate. So whenever energy is required this bond that is between one phosphate molecule and another phosphate molecule breaks and that results in the release of energy. So this energy is utilized for carrying out various metabolic activities in our body. For one ATP molecule nearly 30.5 kilojoule per mole is released. And for one glucose molecule, nearly 38 molecules of ATP are produced. So you can imagine 30.5 into 38 kilojoule energy is released for one glucose molecule. And one glucose molecule means it's just nearly 360, no, it's just 180 gram. So for 180 AMU, that is 180 into 1.6 into 10 raised to minus 24 kilogram glucose, this much energy is released. So for 1 kg of rice or 1 kg of glucose that we consume, enormous amount of energy will be released in our body. So that energy cannot be released directly into the atmosphere because that will result in intense heating of our body that is extremely harmful for us. That is why these energies are getting conserved in the form of energy currencies like ATP, NADPH, FADH and so on. So whenever required they can get converted into ATP and ultimately break the bond releasing energy and that energy can be utilized for various cellular activities, metabolic activities. So here we are going to study about how the uh, body, how the different organisms body is going to take up the oxygen, how it is going to carry out the oxygen metabolism so as to carry out this process of ATP formation. So first of all, in case of plants, the cells which are present on the outer surface of the plant which is the epidermal cells, the epidermal cells can directly take up oxygen. It can directly take up oxygen by the process of diffusion. So diffusion is the only way by which gaseous needs of a plant is happening because plants does not have a respiratory system in place. There are also certain openings on the tree trunks like the Lendi cells which can also help in gaseous exchange in plants. Whereas in the case of animals, in the case of aquatic animals they have very little amount of oxygen and this oxygen is present in water. So this paragraph is very important. The aquatic organisms can just take up the oxygen which is present in the water. So that oxygen which is present in the water which is known as dissolved oxygen is taken up by these aquatic organisms for their own metabolic needs. But in the case of terrestrial organisms we can breathe in the oxygen directly from the atmosphere. That is the benefit of being a terrestrial organism. So terrestrial organisms are better survive, they are 
adapted to better survival because of this ability to take up the oxygen directly from the atmosphere whereas aquatic organisms cannot directly take up the oxygen from atmosphere because they can take up only the dissolved oxygen which is present in the water so now let us see how the transport of oxygen is happening in human beings the oxygen that we are going to take via the nasal passage how is it going to reach the individual cells so let us study it step by step first of all the oxygen is going to enter into the nasal passage and now it is going to enter into the nasal chamber from there it is going into the trachea then to the pharynx then to the larynx ultimately it is going to move into the lungs inside the lungs there are sac like structures which are known as alveoli there are millions of alveoli with nearly one centimeter one millimeter thickness so this is going to help in the exchange of gases it is having enormously high surface area so that the process of diffusion can happen easily so the diffusion is happening between the alveoli and the underlying bloodstream below every single alveoli there is a bloodstream so this is the alveoli and this is the bloodstream so below every single alveoli there is a bloodstream so the oxygen can now pass on from the alveoli into the bloodstream because of the enormous surface area of the alveoli now this oxygen is going to combine with the hemoglobin molecule which is a protein molecule which is present inside the blood that is going to react with the oxygen forming oxyhemoglobin and now this oxyhemoglobin is going to carry the oxygen to the cells suppose this is the cell now once it reaches near the cell it is going to dissociate back that is the oxyhemoglobin is going to dissociate back into oxygen and hemoglobin and the oxygen is going to enter into the cell and the hemoglobin is going to come back this is the process of transport of oxygen so let me explain this once again with the help of a diagram the air have reached the alveoli from the alveoli by the process of diffusion through a diffusion membrane it is going to pass into the bloodstream and in the blood there are hemoglobin so the hemoglobin that is present is going to combine with this oxygen forming oxyhemoglobin now this oxyhemoglobin is going to carry out the transport of oxygen from the alveoli to the individual cells now in the surface of the cell this oxyhemoglobin is going to split giving free hemoglobin and oxygen so now the cell have got oxygen and this hemoglobin is going to come back to the alveoli now in the case of carbon dioxide which is a metabolic waste which is produced by the cells this carbon dioxide is produced by individual cells that carbon dioxide is again reacting with hemoglobin forming carbamino hemoglobin now this carbamino hemoglobin is more stronger as compared to oxyhemoglobin because our hemoglobin is having more affinity towards carbon dioxide than that with oxygen so now this carbamino hemoglobin is going to return back into the alveoli and once it reaches alveoli it is again going to dissociate forming carbon dioxide and free hemoglobin molecule now this carbon dioxide molecule is taken up back by the alveoli now this alveoli is going to pass it through the remaining parts of the respiratory system and it is going to be expelled out back into the atmosphere so this is how the transport of carbon dioxide is happening but carbon dioxide is more soluble as compared to oxygen and as a result of which only certain amount of carbon dioxide is transferred by hemoglobin majority of carbon dioxide is transferred by sol uh, by we can say uh, using a molecule that is known as carbonate ions hco3 minus ions because of extreme solubility of carbon dioxide in water so because carbon dioxide is extremely soluble in water it can form bicarbonate ions and this bicarbonate ions is directly passing through the bloodstream and it ultimately reaches the alveoli so this is another method by which carbon dioxide is expelled out so this was all about the process of respiration in humans as well as in plants once again i will just have a quick summary of respiration that we have done so far the process of respiration begins when a molecule of glucose reaches the cytoplasm of an individual cell 
in the individual cell the glucose which is a six carbon containing molecule that splits into two molecules of three carbon each this three carbon containing molecule is known as a pyruvate molecule now this pyruvate molecule can either enter into the aerobic pathway or it can enter into the anaerobic pathway if it is entering into the aerobic pathway then it will be moving into the mitochondria and it will be releasing three molecules of carbon dioxide and energy whereas if it is going through the anaerobic pathway if it is an yeast or a bacteria it will be forming ethanol and energy in muscle cells it is going to produce lactic acid and energy so this was the basic framework of glycolysis and the remaining steps of aerobic and anaerobic respiration to meet the oxygen requirements the each and every cells of the body should get enough amount of oxygen and that is through an oxygen transport system in plants oxygen transport and the oxygen requirements of the cell are satisfied by means of the symbol diffusion that is if we have a cell the oxygen is going to directly enter inside the cell through a membrane through a semi permeable membrane or a simple membrane that is known as diffusion but in the case of animals we have trillions and trillions of cells so we cannot carry out this simple process of diffusion so in humans and other animals what happens is we have a transport mechanism that is a well defined respiratory system the air that we are breathing in through our nostrils is now moving into the nasal tract finally moving into the lungs once it reaches the lungs there are the alveoli and this alveoli is very small in its size and it is folded many times so as to accommodate nearly 1 million alveoli in a single lungs it is having enormous surface area that is area per unit volume is very high and this is the ideal condition for carrying out the process of diffusion now what happens is that the air that is reaching the alveoli by the process of diffusion passes into the bloodstream in the bloodstream there is hemoglobin molecule which is an iron containing pigment respiratory pigment which helps in the transport of gases like oxygen carbon dioxide carbon monoxide and so on this oxygen reacts with or it's combined with hemoglobin forming oxyhemoglobin this oxyhemoglobin helps in transferring this molecule of oxygen to the cells and in turn the cells is going to release carbon dioxide so in the cells this oxyhemoglobin will dissociate forming oxygen and now the cell got oxygen and whatever waste product was there with the cell that is carbon dioxide that is now going to react with the hemoglobin now this results in the formation of carbaminohemoglobin and this carbaminohemoglobin is going to reach back into the bloodstream in the bloodstream it again dissociates to form carbon dioxide and hemoglobin and the carbon dioxide is taken up by the alveoli and it is expelled out this is the mechanism of transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide by different group of organisms once the cell get oxygen it can easily carry out the process of aerobic respiration in the mitochondria resulting in the formation of the energy currency which is ATP and other forms of energy currency like the NADPH, FMN, FADH and so on. However other molecules such as NADPH, FADH etc get converted into ATP by a process known as oxidative photo or sorry oxidative photo sorry oxidative phosphorylation the process is known as oxidative photo for sorry oxidative phosphorylation which is a process in which other forms of energy currency such as FADH NADH GTP is converting into ATP so I'll note it over here oxidative phosphorylation it is the process in which NADH or NADPH FADH GTP etc are converting into ATP so with this we conclude the second part of this chapter that is respiration now let us move on to the third part of this chapter which is a very crucial part which is circulation and transportation in plants and animals 
Circulation in humans is the first topic that we are going to discuss. Circulation in humans is carried out by the cardiovascular system, also known as the circulatory system. It consists of the heart, blood vessels, and the blood. So let's first study the structure of heart and how the heart functions and then we'll move to blood vessels and blood. So starting with the basic structure of heart. So talking about the heart, it is a muscular organ and if we have to consider the size of the heart, this is going to be the size. That is the size of a clenched fist, the holded fist. This is going to be the size of an individual heart. And this heart has four chambers which is divided into two atria and two ventricles. And these ventricles and atria are very important because this allows the, sorry, this prevents the mixing of blood that is oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So first let's study the structure of the heart and then we'll study the functioning of the heart. So this is how the heart looks like. You can see that this is the right atrium this is the right ventricle so here in biology right and left is just the opposite of our general notation of right and left so here this is the left atrium and this is the left ventricle here you can see that the walls of the atrium are much thinner as compared to the walls of ventricle or the walls of the ventricle are much thicker as compared to the walls of atria reason is because it is the ventricle that have to pump maximum amount of blood to all parts of the body so to pump this much amount of blood the walls of the ventricle should be very thick and also you can see large number of valves here and here and there present like the interatrial septum the interventricular septum the atrioventricular septum and so on these septums and valves are very important because it prevents the backflow of blood so this is the basic framework of a heart. Now let us study how the process of circulation is happening. So to study the process of circulation, I have made a simple diagram over here. This will explain the process of circulation a little more easier. So let's start with this. So first of all here I have made three elements here one is lung this is our lungs this is our heart and this is our blood cells or any of the body cells cells of our body so let us see how the process of circulation is happening in human beings so the blood that is released from the lungs that is oxygenated blood the oxygenated blood that is released from the lungs goes to the heart and from the heart it is going to the different body cells now the body cells as a result of metabolism releases carbon dioxide rich blood and this carbon dioxide rich blood reaches the heart and from the heart this carbon dioxide rich blood reaches the lungs and the lungs again convert it into oxygenated blood and it will transfer it back into the heart this is the cycle that is happening so now we have to study who is carrying out these purposes what are the vessels that is carrying out this transport usually in our body there are two types of blood vessels number one is arteries and number two is veins arteries are used for the transfer of oxygenated blood and veins are used for the transfer of deoxygenated blood so first type of blood is known as oxygenated blood that consists of a large amount of oxygen and that is carried out by the arteries and second type of blood is known as the deoxygenated blood which consists of large amount of carbon dioxide and that is carried out by the veins. So the blood that is carried out from the heart to the body cells, the oxygenated blood which is carried out from the heart to the body cells is carried out by the systemic artery systemic artery and the vein that is going to carry out the carbon dioxide rich blood from the body cells to the heart is known as systemic vein now 
to the lungs anything is known as pulmonary so the blood vessel which is going to carry out the deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs carbon dioxide rich or the deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs is the pulmonary artery this is an exceptional case the only artery which carries deoxygenated blood is the pulmonary artery which carries the deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs and in turn the blood vessel which is carrying oxygen rich blood or the oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart is the pulmonary vein so the only vein which carries oxygenated blood is the pulmonary vein and the only artery which carries carbon dioxide rich blood or the deoxygenated blood is the pulmonary artery so if you have this picture in your hand process of circulation is very easy so now let us study how the heart is going to function so now what happens is that the heart sorry the lungs the lungs is going to pump out the oxygenated blood that oxygenated blood is going to enter via the pulmonary veins and it is going to enter into the left atrium once it reaches the left atrium it is going to undergo the process of contraction and now it is going to enter into the left ventricle from the left ventricle it is going to pass on to the aorta as you can see from the left ventricle it is going to pass on to the aorta and via the aorta it is now going to enter into the systemic artery and it is going to be delivered into the different body parts next the deoxygenated blood that is coming from the body part that is going to be received from the systemic vein by the vena cava and that deoxygenated blood is now going to enter into the right atrium from the right atrium it is now going to enter into the right ventricle and from the right ventricle it is going to the pulmonary arteries and via the pulmonary arteries it is going to the lungs from the lungs it gets oxygenated and now it is going to come back and the cycle continues so there are two rounds of circulation that is happening one is known as the pulmonary circulation that is between the heart and the lungs and another is known as the systemic circulation that is between the heart and the body cells since there are two cycles happening it is known as double circulation so that is a unique characteristic of birds and mammals now why is this double circulation extremely important in birds and mammals because we are four chambered heart we have a four chambered heart so the process of double circulation happens so as to ensure that the carbon dioxide rich blood does not mix us with oxygenated blood because our blood is warm blooded we are warm blooded organisms so for warm blooded organisms there should not be any mixing of blood whereas in the case of fishes it is having a two chambered heart so obviously there is a mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood similarly in the case of amphibians the oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood is coming into a common ventricle so again there can be a mixing of blood but in our case it does not happen and that is the reason why we are more successful than amphibians and reptiles and fishes another exception here is the crocodile crocodile have four chambered heart whereas all other reptiles is having three chambered heart incomplete three chambered heart four chambered heart or three chambered heart crocodile is having a complete four chambered heart so that is an exception so that was about double circulation and we have studied about the mechanism of how heart is functioning so once again let me explain the process of functioning of the heart the blood which is oxygenated by the lungs is carried out into the pulmonary arteries sorry into the pulmonary veins and from the pulmonary veins it is going to pass into the left atria from there it is going to pass through the left ventricle from there it is going to pass through the aorta and via the aorta it is going to move to the body cells from the body cell this is the pathway of oxygenated blood from the body cell the carbon dioxide rich blood is now going to enter into the vena cava via the vena cava it is going to enter into the right atrium from there it is going to moving to the right ventricle and it is released out through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs so this was the pathway of double circulation so that completes the process of double circulation 
now let us understand the concept of blood pressure now we have studied in physics that pressure is nothing but force upon area that is force acting per unit area is known as pressure so the force that is exerted by the blood against the walls of a blood vessel is known as the blood pressure now this pressure is very high in arteries as compared to veins so that is important it is very high in arteries as compared to veins now the pressure inside the artery during ventricular contraction when the ventricles are contracting that is when it is contracting in such a way the pressure is going to be very high right that is known as ventricular systole that particular pressure is known as the ventricular systole pressure and for a healthy individual it is 120 and the diastolic pressure that is during relaxation is 80 mm of mercury that is the normal pressure of a healthy individual so the first pressure is the systolic pressure and the second pressure is the diastolic pressure blood pressure is measured by an instrument known as sphygmo manometer it is measured by sphygmo manometer and if the pressure is higher than this values then the person is suffering from hypertension and hypertension can have serious complications like increased resistance to blood flow blood cannot flow easily and as a result of which it can result in rupturing of the artery and can cause internal bleeding including brain or spinal cord so this was about blood pressure now let us talk about the blood vessels that is the tubes arteries and vessels that carries the blood away from the heart to the various organs of the body since blood emerges from the heart under high pressure the arteries have thick elastic wall because it is coming from the heart with high pressure I told you that ventricles are also having thick uh, walls similarly the arteries are also going to have thick walls whereas in the case of veins they are going to carry out only blood from the lungs so that is why they are going to have lesser pressure and they are going to have thin walls now on reaching the organ or tissue what happens is that this artery is now going to divide into arterioles smaller smaller arterioles now these arterioles are going to split into form many thread like millimeter thick membrane less or even very small membrane is present and these small small vessels are known as capillaries this capillaries is what is opening into the cells so the cells is receiving the blood oxygenated or deoxygenated blood via this particular capillaries so capillaries are the smallest unit of blood vessels so on reaching an organ of the tissue the artery divides into smaller and smaller vessels to bring the blood in contact with the individual cells smallest vessels have walls which are one cell thick and are called as capillaries exchange of material between the blood and the surrounding cells takes place through this thin wall the capillaries then join together to form veins and then it is going to carry the blood away from the organ or the tissue so again the same thing is going to happen so like I will show the picture for this so here you can see this is the capillaries so many capillaries are either going to form artery or it can go to form vein if it is carrying oxygenated blood it will open into artery and if it is deoxygenated blood it is going to open into the vein so this is the concept of blood vessels now inside the blood we have blood corpuscles like the RBC WBC and also we have another component which is known as the platelets platelets are cell fragments cell fragments means they are fragments of main cells or big size cells that is known as mega karyocytes and they are extremely important reason is because they help in preventing leakage or bleeding these platelets will come to the region where there is a bleeding and will stop the process of bleeding and that is why this process is known as coagulation also known as clotting so it will block the surface and as a result of which further bleeding does not happen and this coagulation or clotting is controlled by a series of different proteins about which we will learn in class 11th moving on with the next one that is another body fluid which is known as lymph lymph is another type of body fluid which is involved in transportation now this is also known as a tissue fluid that is another name for lymph through the pores which are present on the walls of the capillaries certain amount of plasma which is present in the blood 
proteins and blood cells are going to escape into the various intercellular spaces and this liquid that is plasma plus blood cells and certain proteins they are going to constitute what is known as tissue fluid or lymph it is similar to the plasma but just the exception is that it is having some proteins as well now this lymph will drain into the lymphatic capillaries from the intercellular spaces and it is going to carry the digested and absorbed fat from the intestine and it is going to drain the excess of fluid from the extracellular spaces back into the blood so all the waste products from the cell is removed into the blood by this lymph and also it will carry the absorbed fat into the cells these are the functions of lymph lymph is also known as tissue fluid so that was the process of circulation in humans now let us discuss about the process of transportation in plants transportation in plants can be carried out by a different types of events the first one is known as diffusion diffusion is a mean of transport in majority of the cells and majority of the parts of the plant diffusion can happen between one cell to another cell or between a part of a cell to another part of a cell it always happens through a membrane and it is always used for short distance transport another method of short distance transport is osmosis osmosis is used for the transport of water so if water have to move from the region of higher concentration to lower concentration through a semi permeable membrane then it can do so by osmosis so diffusion and osmosis are two different methods of transport of substances from the region of higher concentration to lower concentration against a concentration sorry along a concentration gradient through a membrane that is known as a semi permeable membrane however for a tall tree or for a tall plant diffusion and osmosis cannot be the only ways for transport because imagine the root is absorbing the water from the soil but this water need to reach meters and meters tall so that is not possible by using diffusion and osmosis so in those cases there should be specialized organs and organ systems for carrying out the process of transportation and for those purposes we have a transport system in plants which consists of xylem and phloem xylem tissue that is the vessels and tracheids of the roots and stem they are interconnected to form a continuous system of water conducting channels so they are going to form a continuous channel like this throughout the length of the plants at roots cells in the contact with the soil they are going to actively take up ions now active means against the concentration gradients that means in the soil the number of ions is very less so from the region of less concentration of ions now the ions are going to move into the root that is against the concentration gradient using energy so from the soil now the root is going to absorb the ions by utilizing energy that is known as active transport and now these ions are going to move up through the vessels and tracheids of the root stem and leaves it is going to be interconnected and it is going to move to different parts of the plant so this is how the ions are moving now how is the water moving water is also moving in the same manner when the ions are moving what happens is that the concentration of ions at the higher levels of the plants is more this makes the concentration of water at the higher heights of the plant less so now the water will start moving from low sorry high concentration that is from the root all the way up to shoot where its concentration is lower so this is the mechanism by which water is moving this is one accepted theory for the transport of water and ions another accepted theory is the transpiration pull theory now what is transpiration pull theory transpiration pull theory suggests that when water have to move up through the plant the transpiration process will occur that means large amount of water is removed out through the stomatal pore during the day time and it's just like a straw the water is now sucked out through the stomata so the water column will move up continuously this is the process that is happening so as a result of these two processes water can now move up till the top 
topmost region of the plant so these are the two methods by which water can reach these are just two theories which explain how water reaches the top of the plant the complete idea about the transportation of water and ions is still unclear for us now transport of food and other substances happens by mass flow a certain portion is loaded into the phloem tissue and from there it is going to go to the sink that is the region where it should be stored and in those region it can be a fruit or it can be a root whatever it may be wherever the food is to be stored when it reaches that sink region it is going to unload that is it is again going to move from the region of higher concentration to lower concentration that means if I have the leaf over here the concentration of the food is high over here and here the concentration is low so by the process of diffusion there should be process of loading happening to the phloem now this is the source at the sink what happened suppose it's a fruit so the food is going to unload because now the concentration of the food is high over here and low over here so it will move from the region of higher concentration to the lower concentration along the concentration gradient by the process of diffusion or osmosis so this is the process of transport of food which is also known as translocation and that is carried out by a mass flow hypothesis which is also known as the bulk flow hypothesis and this particular theory of how the food is getting transported from one region to another was explained by a scientist named Munch so this is also known as the Munch hypothesis so with this we conclude the process of transportation in plants moving on with the last topic of this chapter that is excretion in human beings excretion is the removal of the metabolic waste from the human body or any other organism as a result of metabolism or the chemical reactions which is happening in our body large number of toxic substances like ammonia urea uric acid get accumulated in our body and these are toxic for our body so they have to be removed out from our body and the process in which these uh, harmful nitrogenous waste are removed from our body is known as excretion and that is carried out by the excretory system so this is the picture of excretory system it consists of a pair of kidneys a pair of ureters a single urinary bladder and a single urethra so these are the four components first one is the kidney there are two kidneys that means a pair of kidney which is located below the abdomen next is the urinary bladder sorry ureter that is connecting the kidney and the urinary bladder and the last one is the urethra which is opening towards the outside this is the basic anatomical structure of the kidney now let us study how the process of excretion is carried out the purpose of urine is to filter out the waste products from the blood so just like how carbon dioxide is removed from the blood in the lungs nitrogenous waste such as urea or uric acid they are removed from the blood so first of all the blood is going to flow through the kidneys inside the kidneys we have the fundamental unit of excretion that is known as the nephrons here we have a picture of a nephron here you can see that the nephron consists of a Bowman's capsule and the next region is known as the glomerulus now Bowman's capsule is basically a tuft of capillaries which is made by the renal artery and the renal vein so all these capillaries together is forming a tuft a collection that collection is known as Bowman's capsule sorry that is known as the glomerulus so now the blood is going to flow through the glomerulus and what is going to happen is that it is going to pass through the glomerulus into the next region that is known as the Bowman's capsule this is the glomerulus from the glomerulus the blood is now going to flow into the Bowman's capsule so once it flows into the Bowman's capsule what happens is there are very small filtration slits which are present over here very small size pores which are present over here and through the pores when these blood is flowing only the proteins get settled here and the remaining part of the blood is now going to move down it is going to move down into the remaining part now when it is passing through the different regions of the nephron what happens is certain nutrients certain ions all these things are secreted or absorbed back into the blood certain substances are secreted into the urine or certain substances are taken back from the urine and ultimately 
only the waste products are received in the collecting duct. So many collecting duct will open into a single ureter. From the ureter, it is going to pass into the urethra and to the outside, urinary bladder to the urethra and to the outside. This is controlled by a reflex which is known as the micturition reflex which is present in our brain. So the urge to urinate will stimulate the receptors which are present on the urinary bladder and that causes the contraction of the urinary bladder which causes release of urine. So this is the process of excretion. First step is the filtration that is happening. Filtration happens in the Bowman's capsule. There are slit pores which are present, very small size pores are present which helps in the filtration process. Once the filtration is done, the blood is now flown through the next region. When it is flowing, what is happening? There is absorption of all the necessary elements in the uh, remaining parts that is we have a duct so many ducts are there like the proximal convoluted tubule the distal convoluted tubule and the Henle's loop so whatever required elements are there in the split that is taken up and whatever else should be given out that is secreted back into this filtrate now the filtrate is now passing through this duct and finally it will reach the collecting duct more than one collecting duct will open into the ureter, ureter from there it will move into the urinary bladder and finally it is reaching the urethra and it is moving to outside. The process of release of urine is known as urination or micturition. So this was about excretion and when we talk about the process of excretion in plants, plants have different strategies for excretion than that of animals. Like here oxygen itself can be a waste product, right? So oxygen is released as a waste product during photosynthesis. For other waste such as we have sap or other things like gums, resins etc. Or those waste can be accumulated in the old leaves of the plant and the old leaf when it is falling off it can causes the removal of those waste products. Also plants can release certain waste products directly into the soil which is present around it and directly question can be asked based on this paragraph. The various methods of excretion in plants so this is important. Moving on with the last case study in this chapter that is artificial kidney or the hemodialysis. Hemodialysis which is also known as the artificial kidney is a boon for many persons who are having a kidney failure. So here what is happening? Here we are connecting the vein. The vein is connected into a heparin. Uh, first it is treated with heparin and it is connected to a tube, a dialyzer tube. And now what is happening? The concentration of the fluid that is present in the dialysing fluid is almost same as that of the blood plasma except that it does not have nitrogenous waste. So now what happens is that from the body the nitrogenous waste are going to move out by the process of diffusion into the dialysing fluid and that is collected separately. So this is the process that is done from a person suffering from kidney failure the person's heparin sorry person's artery is collected to the connected to the dialysis tube and the waste products are released out from the person's body and it is connected to the dialyzing tube and from there it is collected back and it is removed off and fresh blood that is blood which is free from nitrogenous waste is entered back into the body so with this we conclude this long chapter of life processes where we dealt with the process of digestion, circulation, respiration, excretion in humans and also the process of photosynthesis, transport, respiration and excretion in plants. It was quite a lengthy chapter but the topics are very very important. So let's have a quick review of this chapter. We started with the process of nutrition, two types of nutrition. First one is the autotrophic nutrition and the second is the heterotrophic nutrition. Autotrophic nutrition, the steps involved are light reaction and dark reaction. In light reaction, first step is absorption of sunlight and after that photolysis of water, release of electrons, electrons flow through the electron transport system and that results in the formation of ATP and NADPH. This ATP and NADPH are now transported into the stroma and in this stroma happens the dark reaction that is the formation of sugars via the Calvin cycle. And after this the next event that is happening uh, in our syllabus is digestion in human beings and in digestion we have studied five steps. Step number one was ingestion next is digestion absorption assimilation and ingestion 
we study the structure of the alimentary canal and about the function of each and every part maximum of the digestion is happening in the small intestine maximum of the absorption is also happening in the small intestine then we have discussed about the process of respiration about the fate of pyruvate formation of pyruvate happens in the cytoplasm it can either enter into, into the aerobic pathway or into the anaerobic pathway if it is entering into the aerobic pathway then it is happening the mitochondria krebs cycle res resulting in the formation of carbon dioxide and energy and if it is entering into the anaerobic pathway in yeast and other bacteria it results in the formation of alcohol that is basically ethanol and in muscle cells it result, it results in the formation of lactic acid that is again a harmful substance then we have discussed about how the oxygen is transported to the blood and from there to the tissues and how carbon dioxide is reaching back and it is released out from the human body after that we have discussed about the success of the terrestrial organisms over aquatic organisms because we can directly breathe in oxygen from the atmosphere whereas the aquatic organism can just breathe the dissolved oxygen we have also discussed about the process of circulation in human beings about the structure of heart and also the pumping activity of the heart systemic and pulmonary circulation about the double circulation and about the heart structure of birds amphibians reptiles and fishes also we discussed about the structure of blood vessels the different types of blood vessels action of platelets and about lymph then we discussed about transportation in plants about how food is transported how water is transported how ions are transported we discussed two theories transpiration theory as well as the other one that is by the movement of ions next one which we discussed was the process of excretion in plants as well as in humans we discussed about the structure of the excretory system about the nephron how the filtration is happening and after filtration it is moving through the tubes that is the proximal convoluted tubule distal convoluted tubule and the henley's loop and in the pathway necessary elements are absorbed off and new things are secreted inside and there exists a counter current mechanism as a result of which there is a formation of urine and that urine is released out via the urethra by the urinary reflex we also discussed about the basic structure of hemodialysis which is a case study which is not required for the examination purpose of you so last number of questions can be expected from this chapter so we'll discuss the exercises of this together when we discuss the complete biology exercises in a single lecture so i hope you like this lecture we have revised the complete chapter in nearly one hour 45 minutes so if you found this video lecture useful please do like share and subscribe to the channel so that you does not miss out any important notification regarding the upcoming videos thanks for watching